The point of this lecture is to understand um, how fertilizers work and how much to apply them and when to apply them and the rationale for using them at all. So um, one of the techniques of keeping the nutrients in your plants on site after parts of your plants are harvested or mowed or pruned is to do composting right there. Grass cycling is a simple method for cycling all of the nutrients that are in the grass that you mow and all those clippings, you can leave them on, on the lawn and they will degrade quickly and go back into the, the soil of the lawn. So we'll talk about each of these um, points here, these five points, and hopefully you'll get a good idea of when and how to use fertilizers and how much. To start off this lecture on fertilization and applying fertilizers, pose the question, why do we fertilize at all? Shouldn't plants be able to take care of themselves and the natural cycles of leaves falling and decomposing replace the organic matter in the soil that they're getting their nutrients from? Well, no, it doesn't happen like that in the human systems, our landscapes. We often um, remove the nutrients that are in the, the plant that came from the soil through harvesting or pruning, mowing, erosion can take nutrients away from your site. Um, all those things are um, add up to a good reason to keep adding fertilizers. I mean, ideally you would just take all the prunings and mowings and harvest that whatever is left over that you didn't eat and compost it and put it back right there on the soil. And that would almost completely close the loop except for the food you ate that came from the plants. So. Anyways, that's a reason. Another reason is a lot of plants we put in our landscapes are not adapted to this climate or these soils or, or your microclimate. And so we're helping them out. We're giving them more than they would naturally get. Um, also, we all sometimes want plants to perform differently than they would naturally. So um, it's often heard that like our front country here with the chaparral, you know, is not that pretty in the summer. I hear people say that. Um, not everyone, but um, if we gave it more water and a little bit more fertilizer, they would look prettier um, according to most human standards. So we sometimes just add extra um, nutrients and sometimes extra water to, to keep plants looking what we call good more of the year. And if you think about it, what is our whole function of landscaping? Of course, beauty and something that looks good to us and that can vary between the person and that the period of time, you know, their landscaping and plants are are fashionable. There are certain things um, that are fashionable at the one period that may not be later. And um, also what one area <clears throat> of the country likes and thinks is um, attractive or improves your property value may not be what others think. For example, I lived in Ohio. If I had taken all my um, front yard out and put in um, California gold gravel and succulents and um, kangaroo paws, people in Ohio and Cincinnati would have looked at me like I had two heads. Here, if you do it, it's like, oh, you're updating and making it kind of look trendy and contemporary and doing water conservation. And that's pretty cool here in Santa Barbara. Also, um, like I said, there's fashions too. And if you walk around City College, uh, a couple of students said that to me just this week. It kind of looks like we're in the 70s as far as the plants that are planted. And that was true. A lot of those plants on City College campus are uh, were planted in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, some in the 50s, and even in the 40s. So it's dated, and the fashions are um, have changed with landscaping. People don't plant a bunch of junipers anymore and pittosporum so much, not the big ones. Um, so they change. So we like visual satisfaction and beauty and then for function too. We fertilize um, to help something like a soccer field um, stay thick and green for playing games on or for food production in other situations, etc. Let's first talk about what are the plant nutrients. All of these listed here on this slide are nutrients. There's macronutrients, the, nu the nutrients that are needed in large amounts by the plant, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then others, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, magnesium. Those are all needed in large amounts. The first three, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are obtained by the plant from either air or water. We as plant caregivers don't have to focus so much on that in, in our fertilizer applications. 
Then there's also micronutrients that are needed in small trace amounts, and you can see a number of them there. A little bit more information about macro and micronutrients. You can use this mnemonic device, Schnapps CalMag Pot, to remember carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, potassium are the macronutrients. And micronutrients, they're needed in much less quantities than the macronutrients. They're measured in um, only about five to 200 parts per million in the plant tissue, where as opposed to two to 4% of the plant tissue can be macronutrients. Um, students a while back came up with this one, Chimborzico, and that is a mnemonic device for chlorine, iron, manganese, molybdenum, boron, zinc, and copper. Let's talk about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, three of the main macronutrients that is the focus of most fertilizers, especially inorganic fertilizers, ones that are not organic. One thing to note here, this is telling you the macronutrient, its element symbol, its mobility within the plant, and then a little bit of information about its function in the plant. Nitrogen is um, mobile in the plant, as are phosphorus and potassium. And on the right list, some of their functions. Here you have the same type of slide, but with calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. You're seeing here that calcium and sulfur are not mobile, and magnesium is. So when it's not mobile, it means the plant takes it in through its roots, incorporates it into the infrastructure of its body, a cell wall or an organ or something about the plant's body needed calcium. And at that point, if it's not mobile, it's fixed there. The plant can't um, re detach it from where it is um, incorporated and move it about if calcium is needed somewhere else. Something like magnesium or nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those ones can be moved around so they can go into a plant, become part of the cell wall, the cell membrane, the DNA, and amino acid. But if, if nitrogen or magnesium is needed somewhere else in the plant, they can be moved from those, those structures and removed from the structures and moved to a new place. And this is important because it helps in diagnosing nutrient deficiencies. So we can look at the plant itself and have a better understanding of what is lacking. So we know what to add in a fertilizer. Here are some micronutrients and their mobility and functions in the plant. So now that you understand a little bit about the nutrients and their uh, mobility, immobile nutrients do not easily move in the plant. So when deficiency occurs, they show up in the new growth, like the left photo, those are soybeans and they're green, older leaves, darker green, and then the new leaves, the new growth doesn't have enough um, nutrient there. Something like calcium or iron is probably missing. And so the new leaves are deficient in that. If it was a mobile nutrient, like something like nitrogen, on the right picture is corn that's aging, but it's also um, the soil is nutrient deficient, nitrogen deficient. So in that sense, that nutrient can be moved from the older leaves and taken to the new growth. So the new growth stays green, but the old leaves stay yell or turn yellow with a nitrogen deficiency. So if you walk out to your plant and you see yellowing new leaves, it could be one set of uh, nutrient deficiencies, but if you see yellowing older leaves, it's something like nitrogen that is probably deficient. This slide is just to take a moment to consider this. Not something to memorize, but just a kind of an interesting thing to look at how amazingly similar the human blood molecule of hemoglobin is to the plant chlorophyll molecule. In human blood hemoglobin, the center of this structure is iron, Fe, and in a plant, a very, very similar structure with the center of it being magnesium, that's the chlorophyll molecule. You also can note at the bottom left of the plant chlorophyll molecule, there's a chain that says at the very bottom C20. So there's 20 carbon chain that goes down from there. So it has a long tail and that makes it pretty different, but the center of it is so similar. Kind of makes you wonder, you know, if, if we had some kind of distant relative between plants and animals or people. Okay, there are two types of fertilizers, organic and synthetic. Organic come from basically the 
dead bodies of animals and plants and by um, kind of just naturally their slow release meaning they slowly break down um, and turn into something that the plants can absorb. There are some organic fertilizers now that are fast release like bird guano which is really high in nitrogen and becomes available to the plant very quickly when you add water. Synthetic fertilizers are chemically produced usually in some kind of industrial process. There are man-made fertilizers or human-made fertilizers that take a while to release the nutrients, something like Osmocote. And there are also fast-release human-made fertilizers whose nutrients are immediately available upon mixing with water, like miracle Grow. Here's an example of a synthetic fertilizer for lawns. It's called Turf Supreme, just one of many examples of things out there on the market. It has the three numbers on it. This one says 1668. That stands for the percent um, by weight of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that bag of fertilizer. So if that was a 100 pound bag of fertilizer, there would be um, 16 pounds would be nitrogen, six pounds would be phosphorus, and eight pounds would be potassium. When you're using fertilizers that are organic, unlike the last one, um, usually the numbers are lower. It's harder to get high concentration of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in an, um, in an organic fertilizer because it comes from living organisms, you know, plants and animals, their waste or their bodies made into fertilizer. And there's just usually not that high of a proportion of those three um, elements in or nutrients in their bodies. So feather meal, bone meal, blood meal, bird guano, chicken manure, horse manure, those ones usually have fairly high levels of nitrogen. In this one, Dr. Earth Supernatural Pure Natural Handcrafted Blend for lawns is 905, which is pretty good. 9% by weight of nitrogen is pretty high for um, a, an, org an organic fertilizer. So comparing the two, the synthetic lawn fertilizer with an orga another organic one here. Remember the synthetic one was 1668. Here it says 735. You can see the synthetics usually have can get a higher concentration of the nitrogen and other nutrients in general. Azomite is an example of another organic natural fertilizer. It's low in its percentage of nutrients, but it provides a lot of different nutrients. Uh, the word azomite is made, is made up, meaning A to Z organic minerals and trace elements. It's alleged to have all the elements in the periodic table in it. It comes from um, mined directly from a, a source in the desert in Utah. I think it's a volcanic uh, origin, originally, or originates as volcanic kind of material or ash but it has a lot of different micronutrients in it. So this is really good for adding micro, micronutrients into your soil. And I know I showed you a few slides on the functions of the macronutrients and micronutrients. Those were, those first ones were more detailed. This is more general, and this is what I want you to focus on in your studies. Nitrogen stimulates photosynthesis and it's used in the plant for above ground vegetative growth. So lots of new leaves and branches. Here are some sources, synthetic and organic, for that nitrogen. Phosphorus is, uh, stimulates flower, fruit, and root production in a plant. Like a rose fertilizer would have high levels of phosphorus because really all we care about in roses are the flowers. And there's a listing of some sources of organic and inorganic phosphorus. Lastly, of the big three of NPK is K, potassium. Um, it stimulates plant vigor, disease resistance, and pest resistance. And the all around kind of thing to remember if you're trying to remember the functions of NPK in an easy way is up, down, all around for NPK. The up is the above ground vegetative growth for nitrogen. Down is the root growth asterisk means also fruit and flower production but mostly root growth and then all around is the potassium and that is the overall vigor of the plant 
that it stimulates and supports. Have you ever noticed that if you add too much nitrogen fertilizer like manure to a, a vegetable bed like tomatoes the plants just get big and leafy and grow huge but then they don't produce that many flowers or tomatoes. That's probably because you're you, you added so much nitrogen the plant um, just does a lot of above ground vegetative growth but it doesn't think it needs to reproduce because there's so much um, nitrogen available it just keeps doing vegetative growth so you don't you know you'll want to dial down the nitrogen if that happens to you so the plant gets a little bit stressed and thinks it needs to reproduce and make fruits and seeds so I want to talk a little bit about the negatives of using really high solubility nitrogen fertilizers like the synthetics like miracle Grow, that you just add water and they're instantly all the nitrogens available to the plant right away well because of that the plants can't absorb all of it usually and a lot of those chemical fertilizers get washed away into the soil into the creeks into the ocean lakes and they cause over over um, concentrated waters that have too much nitrogen in them and then you get algal growth and the algae can consume and limit the oxygen in the water for the fish so it's a problem it's it's a pollut pollutant so fast acting fertilizers give roots only a few nutrients too miracle Grow gives them like two so they need all the other ones so they're very narrow usually the synthetic um, high solubility fast acting fertilizers um, do not include micronutrients um, we talked about the pollution potential um, fast growing plants like what I talked about with your perhaps your overly nitrogen fertilized tomatoes they grow really fast and really soft and succulent and they tend to attract pests that it's easier for the pests to bite into them or poke their mouth parts in to suck out the tissue juices so um, and I've, I'm not just uh, saying this as an abstract concept I've talked to many gardeners who say like um, that they would if they use too many fertilizers they get fast growth and they get a lot of aphid and other insects swarming in and then lastly the production of many synthetic fertilizers use fossil fuels as their base so one more problem with kind of green greenhouse gas emissions here's a chart showing you the advantages and disadvantages of these different nutrient source you can use green waste or organic fertilizers or synthetic slow release like osmocote or synthetic fast release let's just look at a couple of the advantage and disadvantages and you can look at the rest on your own organic fertilizers tend to be more expensive so that's considered kind of a negative if you look at the long run they might not be that much more expensive because you'd be having to buy um, a bunch of different fertilizers uh, synthetics to um, to be able to capture the range of nutrients that are needed for by plants um, with synthetics low labor costs it's pretty quick and you can get them the um, nutrients they need right away green waste or compost very easy to um, well I wouldn't say easy it takes energy to make compost but you don't have to go buy anything you know drive to a place to you know garden store to get compost and bring it back it's right there on site saves transport fees um, the organisms in your compost will be compatible with your native organisms because you got it there right on site so that's a good thing too um, green waste has low NPK value so if you need something that's really high in nitrogen phosphorus and potassium or something else you may want to try some other source either organic or synthetic if your plants really deficient in some particular nutrient so in general when we're talking about sustainability in the long-term health of your soil and even your pocketbook organics are better and um, there's lots of different ways and lots of different types of organic fertilizers you can use making your own compost and using the mulch mulching up or chopping up plants from your own site and putting them back on the soil is also a really good idea of course you also need to have adequate irrigation for the plants but also for these uh, these fertilizers to be able to break down all the microbes in the soil that do the decomposition of organic fertilizers which releases the nutrients in those organic fertilizers to the plant 
they require water to survive so you need adequate irrigation for this process to occur and only fertilize as much as you need and when necessary not just like once a month do the same fertilizer regime um, without really looking at the plants and looking at the soil and seeing if there is a need now let's talk a little bit about nutrient addition through grass cycling grass cycling is another way to reduce the amount of input to your landscape by leaving those grass clippings right on your lawn instead of raking them up um, sometimes you can put a some lawnmowers where they might kick out the clippings into a, a bag or some catchment container you can plug that some of the the lawnmowers have like a plastic plug to put there so the grass mowings the clippings stay inside the lawnmower and go around and around longer and get chopped up even finer and that's a good way to leave those clippings on the soil and they should break down pretty quickly grass grows fast uses a lot of nitrogen so really those grass clippings are your own capital you paid for the water and the nutrients that are in those grass clippings so why put them in the green waste and send them away keep them on site if you can so this shows you some of the, the pros and cons of leaving grass clippings as opposed to removing them on your site. You know, really most people don't do it because they don't think it looks very neat to have these kind of piles and rows, lines of grass clippings on top of their newly cut lawn. So a lot of clients might not want you to do that. So another option, if someone doesn't and you still, you could maybe talk them into getting a, a small contained compost pile where you could put the clippings in there. And then when they break down somewhat, put those grass clippings or that compost around shrubs and trees in the kind of the background of the beds and near fences where no one sees it, where it's a great mulch full of good nutrients, but, and it doesn't leave the site and it can decompose slowly on its own. Just in case you're interested, because um, when you do leave your clippings or grass clippings on the lawn they usually break down and can be recycled in just a couple of days radioisotope labeled um, molecules inside the grass and um, has been used as a way to study how fast these break down and the, the clippings decompose very quickly and become um, nutrients available to the plant the grass plants just within a few days and sucked back up so it's a great cycling of the nitrogen on site instead of removing it lots of grass clippings occur you know especially throughout the nation and um, so this could be a really good way to um, be conserving in our landscaping fertigation is also a thing it's not super popular but in some instances it is it's when liquid fertilizer is delivered through the irrigation system um, out to your garden beds and your landscape it's something that's kind of similar to what's done in hydroponic agriculture. But um, you can do that as long as your irrigation system can handle it. Even liquid compost tea can be put directly into an irrigation system and delivered to the plants through those irrigation emitters. Compost tea is when you use compost to inoculate a vat of water that is highly aerated with microorganisms to grow more of them. You're growing soil organisms, bacteria and fungi, and brewing them up so you get a um, vat of water or a volume of water that has a lot of good aerobic soil bacteria and fungi in it, and then you can drench your soil with that, and that just increases the soil's ability to decompose organic matter and release nutrients to the plants. You can also spray compost tea directly onto the leaves of the plants, not just a soil drench, as a foliar application. And that is effective way for uh, plants to get nutrients directly into their leaves. The, the actual nutrients, if you add it to the compost tea, can um, go um, through and between the cells of the leaves and get right to where it's needed much more quickly than if you put it on the soil, either the new the fertilizer or compost tea onto the soil and wait for the roots to take it up. So this could be kind of like an emergency technique for getting nutrients into leaves and into a plant. This is kind of a lot of detail here, but basically one compost tea experiment um, compared corn fields in Guanajuato, Mexico, and they took compost tea and put it on some of the plots within the corn field and then 
also had um, other control plots where there was none added and the results show showed that there um, was almost three times as much um, high quality corn from the areas in the milpa that had compost tea added compared to the areas that had none added the biomass um, was higher in the plants and the the harvest for the compost tea areas compared to the non-compost tea areas. It was just better overall. If you do want to do a foliar application of fertilizer, here's some information on how that can be advantageous to you over adding the fertilizer to the soil. And this is just a list of how fast the nutrients are, are absorbed into the plant um, as a foliar different uh, on bean plants. So this is a study that was done using different nutrients and how fast they can get in to the plant through a foliar fertilizer application. Of course there's always the illegal human manure that can be used as a fertilizer but before you um, laugh too much um, um, there are people that use for um, human manure so our excretion and gathered it up and use it in like in a composting toilet where it's anaerobically composted for a few months and then aerobically composted for a few months after that and then placed on around fruit trees and other perennials and trees not annual vegetable plants it's totally safe and it's you know it has about a year since it's come out of humans bodies and all the microbes that are not good for people are completely gone and it has lots of nitrogen and other good um, nutrients in it on that topic, some people usually ask, what about human urine? Um, water is about 95% of urine, and there's um, a good amount, 2.5%-ish, of um, nitrogen in human urine. And there's a little bit of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and some B vitamins, and some other strange things, depending on what the person ate. But if you dilute it 10 to 1 with water, it can be um, a good nitrogen fertilizer. Now let's look at some fruit tree fertilization facts. So remember we're talking about fruit trees now for the rest of this lecture to give you because a lot of people grow fruit trees in their yards and landscapes or orchards and they're the ones the fruit trees are the ones that have been highly bred to produce really good fruits and they're usually weaker in general as an, an organism. They need more fertilizer, more pest control, more water, they, they're less heat and cold tolerance so they're just a little more they're a lot more finicky than your normal just ornamental shrubs and trees that are not fruit bearing so a mature citrus and fruit tree for example about 15 to 20 feet foliage diameter so the drip line is about 15 to 20 feet in diameter it requires about a pound of nitrogen per year so just think of can, can remember in your head about a pound of nitrogen annually for a mature fruit tree Roughly about three pounds of fruit tree fertilizers per inch of tree trunk diameter will, at your chest height, will supply about that amount. So these are just general rules of thumb. So here's a sample kind of scenario to look through and see if you understand it. Again, we're talking about our basic fruit or citrus tree that's um, mature. So if you're using a fertilizer, that is labeled 3.75, 1.5, 1.75. And I chose those numbers not randomly, be, but because they are a landscape, the landscape fertilizer mix that we use a lot at the Santa Barbara City College campus comes from Island Seed and Feed. And that are that those are the percentages for NPK in that landscape mix. So in that, how many pounds of nitrogen are there in 100 pound bag of fertilizer? Well, 3.75 pounds by weight in that 100 pound bag. Usually you don't buy a 100 pound bag. So how many are pounds of nitrogen are there in a 50 pound bag, which is what you normally buy? That'd be about 1.9 pounds. And how many pounds of nitrogen are there in a one in one pound of that fertilizer? About 0.04 pounds of nitrogen. Here's a list of the ingredients in Island Seed and Feeds landscape mix. So um, I don't get any kickbacks for talking about island seed and feed, but I like the mix a lot. We use it a lot. You can use it as much as you can. Very, very difficult to overdo organic fertilizers. 
um, and it comes from a range of different organisms, the alfalfa, kelp, fish, cottonseed, feather. They're all used to mix and make this fertilizer. And they're also just a local store. Not everyone carries a organic fertilizer landscape mix like this, so we um, have uh, tended to use it a lot. Usually with fertilizer, you want to work that in to the soil below the drip line. Um, if you're using compost teeth, the same thing. Um, and that's the easiest way to do it. Compost contains small amounts of all the essential micronutrients, so compost is great, or fertilizer, or the compost tea, all are added, usually pretty much just under the drip line. Now the roots of trees, especially mature tree, go quite a bit further than that, but you know, usually there's a lot more plants in a landscape, so you can't go too far past the drip line. And that's usually good enough too. A lot of the feeder roots are right under the drip line of those plants, the trees and shrubs. Learning to diagnose nutrient deficiencies by looking at the above ground portion of the plant is an important skill for a landscaper or gardener or farmer. Nutrient deficiencies often show up as a yellowing or loss of pigment in leaves that is called chlorosis. It's the loss of chlorophyll in the cells of the leaves and they get yellow and the tissues die. As I said earlier, if you have a light green color or yellowing of the older leaves, it's a nitrogen deficiency. You're looking at this picture where there's plenty of nitrogen on the left side and lower levels on the right side. And these are older leaves. Low acidity or basic soils um, that reduces pH can be also the cause of this because it makes nitrogen less available. And high acidity, uh, high acidity soils also can be the same. So if you, it's good to um, try to diagnose nutrient deficiencies by looking at the leaves and these different types of symptoms, but also test the pH of the soil too. Because a soil can have all the nutrients that a plant needs in it, but if the pH is pretty high or pretty low, meaning too alkaline or too acidic, those nutrients become bound up in the soil and aren't available for the plant, and you'll get deficiencies just because the pH is off. And there are things you can add um, to change that and adjust your pH, as it says here. Um, basic or alkaline soils, you can add ammonium nitrate to it to increase, um, make it more acid, um, which would be the same as lowering the pH, or calcium nitrate is something you can add to very acidic soils to make them more alkaline. Here in our soils, in, especially in coastal California, we usually have enough phosphorus in the soil. Um, but if your soil is phosphorus deficient, you'll, things like on a citrus tree, you'll get a thicker rind and it will be less sweet and the fruit will be larger. Potassium deficiency um, in things like peach, plum, nectarine can leave the um, leaves turning pale and yellowish and tending to curl or burning along the edges. So a fertilizer treatment can work for many years, usually. Addition of potassium was given to the fruit on the left, and that increased the fruit size and the whole situation. This is a, the common look of something like a micronutrient deficiency. Not all of them, but zinc and sometimes um, manganese and iron can have this look of the leaves where the veins of the leaves stay dark green, but the in between the veins um, gets that chlorosis or yellowing. A foliar spray with a synthetic zinc can work well to cure that. And um, it this zinc chlorosis develops on the inner or older leaves first and then progresses outward. Iron deficiency gives a bleached yellow to white leaves with green veins. It's pretty easy to detect, but it kind of looks like um, the zinc one too, except it's not so um, in the zinc, it's not so bleached out, and in iron here, they do get kind of whiter, whitish leaves. And a nice chart that can tell you all of the possible symptoms and the suspected nutrient that is deficient causing that symptom, so you know what kind of fertilizer to add to remedy that. And the last slide covers something pretty similar. Let's ch check that out. 
I like these too because it shows you the nutrient and where that symptom that or that deficiency of that nutrient would show up in the plant. The tips, the new growth or the middle growth or the oldest leaves at the bottom. There you go.